Welcome to In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson. Join us as we learn from area professors and teachers as they bring you their thoughts and knowledge of the study of the Sunday School lesson for today. Now, here is today's program. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining us in the Word again this week. We're continuing uh, in the letter of Paul to the Romans. It's our fourth of four lessons before we move on to other passages in the Scripture. And Dr. Roberts and I are looking forward to uh, wrapping up Romans, right? This quarter of study (laughs) and the four weeks in Romans. Putting a wrap on Romans. Um, And we come now, uh, last week we had a fairly unfamiliar passage from chapter 11. And this week we have a very familiar familiar. passage. Again, one of those favorites of a lot of people. It is, and it's well-deserved. Its Mm -hmm. its reputation is well-deserved. We're in in Romans chapter 12. Um, We've been kind of outlining Romans every week when we uh, have our lessons. But uh, I think it's, uh, Romans is so well-organized by Paul in, in its composition that yeah. it's, it's helpful to remember the, the trajectory that we're on as we move through it. He began in the first three chapters by telling us why we need salvation. Mm-hmm. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, uh, Jews as well as Gentiles. And then he talks about the means of salvation, faith in Jesus Christ, and the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. Um, then there was kind of an interlude that we talked about last right. week. <laughs> After <laughs> chapter 8, mm-hmm. 9 through 11 is the passage primarily about the Jewish people. Yeah, what happened to the Jews? Why did they mess out on right. all of this yeah. is what we were exploring last week. Now we come back, pick up the train of thought that he kind of temporarily left off at the end of chapter 8. We're picking it back up at the beginning of 12. Mm-hmm. And uh, chapter 12, verse 1, begins with the word, therefore. Yep. And therefore always points us back to some logical connection. And this time it points way back. <laughs> right. <laughs> it goes on. The whole first eight chapters, now chapter 12. And, and typically with Paul's epistles, his, his letter writing, he'll have doctrinal teaching. And then he'll bring it down to the point of the practical mm-hmm. application. And chapters 12 through the end of the book in Romans is the practical application. It really is. It's very direct, uh, personal, life application mm-hmm. of the, uh, the principles of, of salvation that he's been talking about in those first eight mm-hmm. chapters. After this three-chapter parenthesis or right. interlude or, or break yeah. uh, that we had. So um, we come to the implications of what he's been talking about here for the Christian life and this is a, a beautiful passage. Uh, chapter 14 has lots of very practical instructions. Chapter 15. Uh, chapter 13 is interesting. It talks mm-hmm. about our relationship to the government. Right. To the, yeah. to the pagan government mm-hmm. uh, under which they were living. And mm-hmm. it has principles that I think we can apply as well. Mm-hmm. But uh, we'll be in chapter 12. All right. So good. Well, you can read for us then go ahead and those read first eight verses. First eight verses of Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts, according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. 
If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Well, that's a lovely passage. Those first two mm. verses are especially well known, I think, right. to, to many Christians. But the whole passage is, is meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, he begins... Uh, by this word, therefore, which connects it back to right. the first eight chapters we talked about. The verb he uses, uh, which the NIV translates, I urge you, is a pretty strong word. It has the idea of encouraging uh, or admonishing someone to do something. It's actually the same word that he uses down in verse 8 for encourage. Mm -hmm. I encourage you <laughs> to do this. I, yeah. I urge you to do this. Now, um, we've been reading this phrase, brothers and sisters, that Paul uses to address his reading audience. Yeah. And we haven't discussed that, but there is something we probably should mention there. If you have an older version, English translation of the, of the New Testament, you'll just have the word brothers many Even times. Even the older NIV. Yes. Just had brothers. Yeah. But this newer, updated NIV has brothers and sisters. And that's bothered sisters. a lot of people because mm -hmm. they say, well, that's not, that's not accurate with the scripture mm -hmm. because you've added a word. Mm -hmm. But when it talks about brothers or brethren, yeah. the old phrase, it's not meaning males. Right. It means that in an inclusive way. Yeah. In our society and our use of language, have changed over the years to the point where now men, brothers, means males. Right. And it, it didn't in the past, but it does now. Right. And we have to let the English translation speak to the oh. current situation. Yeah. So when, when Paul addressed uh, these letters and called his readers brothers, or when Peter was preaching and said brothers, he wasn't, Paul wasn't writing, Peter wasn't preaching, just to the man right. in the crowd. Yeah. He was preaching to all of them. And so the word brothers actually function as kind of a gender inclusive term, mm -hmm. meaning siblings mm -hmm. in the faith. Yeah. And uh, so now given the, the cultural changes that you're discussing, the, the best way to interpret this and therefore to translate it is yeah. to say brothers and sisters. I, you know, we grew up in Christian churches, which are not a denomination, mm -hmm. But we always talked about the brotherhood yes, of Christians, right. uh -huh. meaning all of us who are a part of this movement. Men and women. But it was men and women we yeah. meant, and yet we just said brotherhood. Right. And yeah. it's not as inclusive. So the, uh, the new NIV and other modern translations have added these wor the, the words and sisters. And that is a correct interpretation. It really is, yeah, yes. That is yeah. correct, even though... Originally, it was just the word brothers. Yeah. All right, well, we wanted to talk that through. Yeah. And uh, some people may have noticed and wondered what was going on there. Mm -hmm. um, now, God's mercy, God's uh, tender heartedness toward us, God's compassion toward us is the basis for everything that God has done. Yes. And even though the word mercy doesn't appear very often in Romans, I think the concept of it underlies it. Uh, we read... Uh, I think it was just last week about the kindness of God, yeah. which is a, a parallel thought. And, and the, the grace of God is implied in the mercy. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, chapter five of Romans where Paul says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That, that's the mercy of God yeah. expressed on yeah. the cross. Uh, now, what he urges them to do is to offer their bodies as a living, holy and pleasing sacrifice. I want to comment on that word bodies because when we use the word bodies, we think of the physical part of our existence, mm -hmm. right? We sometimes, you know, body, mind, and spirit or body, right. mind, and soul or, or something yeah. like that. As if body were a synonym for flesh. Flesh and blood or flesh something. Flesh and blood, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case either in uh, the Hebrew use of the word body or the Greek use of the word body. Mm -hmm. It meant the whole being. The mm -hmm. whole person. Mm -hmm. So body means flesh, soul, spirit, mm -hmm. mind. Attitude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. that whole thing. So yeah. present your bodies doesn't just mean your physical bodies. It means present your whole person, your mm -hmm. whole being. And I think that adds a little bit um, mm -hmm. to our understanding. Of In that. the living sacrifice, 
would have been an oxymoron to either the Hebrew or the pagan background where they were familiar with animal sacrifices. You killed the animal yeah, and yeah. sacrificed it. A sacrifice it. isn't living, that's right. the, by definition. huh? Yeah. So uh, why would he risk this uh, oxymoron, do you think, and well, use the phrase living sacrifice? He's, he's bringing it down to the point where our offering to God is on a continuing living basis. Yeah, It's not just once only death. But it's a, it's a, the the life we live yeah. is a sacrifice to God. Yeah, martyrdom may in fact be one result of faithful Christian following mm -hmm. and and witness, but it's it's not the one that's that's really called on by mm -hmm. Jesus or by his apostles. Yeah. Um, the sacrifice of our aliveness means that we we sacrifice our will to his will mm -hmm. and as we live it out day by day in mm -hmm. our lives. And, and we present our lives to God as an offering, mm -hmm. as, as a, a thanksgiving for what he's done. As yeah. The other two adjectives here are holy and pleasing. Holy, um, we've talked about before, meaning to be set apart to God or to mm -hmm. set yourself apart for the purposes of God. So that's one way in which we use our whole life. Mm -hmm. we, give, we give our aliveness. We also consecrate ourselves. And then this idea of pleasing to God, it, yeah. that's been popping up in Romans a, a couple of yes. times, that the, the, the goal of our lives is to please God. I can't help but think that um, God expressed his pleasure in Jesus mm -hmm. several times in this the Gospels. This is my beloved son. In yeah. whom I am well pleased. pleased. Yeah. And that's one of the ways in which following Jesus brings us closer to God. Um, our purpose is also to please God, just, mm -hmm. as, as, his, mm -hmm. as, just as our Lord's was. Pleasing to God. Now verse 1 ends with a, a phrase that gets translated in a variety of ways. The NIV translates, this is your true and proper worship. But those words can, are, are kind of multi, have multiple meanings. They're loaded they? with meanings, <laughs> yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's not that we can't figure out what they mean, it's just that they, they mean s s a kind of a spectrum of meaning, mm -hmm. each one. Um, well, what do you want to take? Do you want to take that true and proper? <laughs> well, yeah. The, <laughs> or worship? Which the, take your the, pick. <laughs> the, the logic on the, the uh, reasonable worship, it's sometimes called, or spiritual worship mm -hmm. in one translation. But it's a, again, it's a, it's a whole person commitment. It's not some kind of a, a pious thing that's separated from life. It's the reality of life and the fullness of living presented before God. Mm -hmm. And the, the word worship is really a word of service, but it's usually used as a religious service. Yeah. It's often applied to priests. Mm -hmm. And so their act of service was conducted in the context of worship. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's service as worship or worship as service. Yeah. We even have the phrase worship service, right? Yeah, or a service right. of worship sometimes. So the two do uh, connect together. And, and this reminds us of the priestly role that we all have. You know, mm -hmm. First Peter 2, 9 makes it very clear that uh, we, we are, we, the church, are a holy nation, yeah. uh, a royal priesthood. Yeah. And so we live out our lives of service in part uh, as worship, yeah, or in part, and it's, in worship, it's reasonable, it's spiritual, yeah. it's logical, it's yeah. it's part of the the essence of life. Yeah, for that adjective, I'm kind of drawn to the word appropriate. Mm -hmm. It's appropriate to what God has done for us, and it's appropriate to our relationship to God. Mm -hmm. So this is our appropriate service. This is presenting our bodies as a living holy, pleasing sacrifice mm -hmm. is only appropriate. That's true. Given yeah. what, what God has done for us and yeah. what, what we should do for God. Well, uh, so a lot of interesting phrases there in mm -hmm. verse 1. Now, verse 2 is a very uh, well-known verse among Christians. Um, first, what we should not do and then what we must do. Yeah, J.B. Phillips 
in a paraphrase similar to the message that's mm -hmm. more recent, coined the, the expression, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, the con that's the idea of conforming. conformity. Yeah. Yeah. So don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. The word world can also be translated age. So does it mean the, the world in which we live? Or does it mean the times in which we live? And I think the answer is both. Both, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so Paul is uh, recognizing that the, the pagan world in which most of the people reading Romans or mm -hmm. hearing Romans were living um, was one that was inimical to the will of God. It was just contrary yeah. to the will of God. And he said, I understand the forces that are at work on you, the oh, cultural yeah. forces all the time to squeeze you into the mold of the pagan world. Mm -hmm. And um, we face the same thing. Yeah, and it can be fads, it can be customs, it can be trends, mm -hmm. but when Inter it's away from God. Entertainment uh, yeah. things. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, the, the, the temptation to conformity with this world age, this time and culture in which we live, mm -hmm. is very powerful. The, the contrast, and he contrasts it with a strong word, the word but, there are, there are three different words for but, and this yeah. is a pretty strong one. This is not the strongest, yeah. but this is a strong one. On the contrary, be transformed. And this doesn't uh, speak to outer appearances or mm. fads or anything. This speaks to a, a deep and abiding transformation of our character and mm -hmm. our who we are as people. Yeah, the, the Greek contrast, the, the morphe, the, the metamorphosis, like mm -hmm. the caterpillar becoming a butterfly. It's yeah. the, the radical change of the substance of who you In are. The very essence of yeah. who you are. Yep, mm -hmm. that's transformation. Uh, now, he describes this transformation as being a renewing of our mind. We might be tempted to think that the Christian transformation is just new attitudes or a new mindset. It is that, yeah, but, but it's more than that, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah. And, and, and uh, it's more than the cognitive, rational function. It includes the personality, the character, the whole person. Yeah. yeah, it's not actually the word mind, it's the word understanding, which, you, which talks about, the, like, like you're saying, the whole everything, the mm -hmm. character of the person. So it's not just a new way of thinking, it's just, it's a whole new way of being. Renewal of your person. Yeah, yeah. renewal of your person. Now, um, but by that kind of transformation, uh, we'll come closer to understanding and living out God's will. This phrase, test and approve, is in, in other English translations, our viewers might see only the word test. Yeah, it's proved by testing. Proved by testing, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a word that was commonly used in the assaying of metal. If you, if you got ore and you wondered, is there any gold in that ore? Mm -hmm. You would put it in a crucible and, and put it to the test. You'd put a burner under mm -hmm. it, right, a flame, and it would burn off the impurities, and hopefully there'd be some gold left. Yeah. That way you had tested it so as to prove that there right. is gold there. And that's the meaning of this word, Yeah, to test so as to approve what is God's will. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And that's the perfect is the complete or fullness. The, the fullness of God's will. Yeah. yeah. So another three, three adjectives there like we had in verse 1. Mm -hmm. Well, um, this kind of transformation of thinking uh, has a direct impact not only on our relationship with God's will, but it has an impact on our relationship with our fellow Christians and with our fellow human yes, beings. Absolutely. And that's what Paul turns to next, starting mm -hmm. in verse 3, right? Um, he calls them once again to humility, as he has many times before. Mm -hmm. Do not think more highly of yourself than you ought, according to verse 3. Yeah. We, uh, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment. Uh, we saw this as an admonition to the Gentiles. In chapter 11. Don't get the big head. Right. <laughs> um, and now he applies it very broadly. Yeah. I can't help but think of Philippians chapter 2, mm -hmm. where he says, uh, you just have to think more highly of others than of yourselves. Yeah. 
And that doesn't mean we demean ourselves. No, yeah, but he goes on to, to say, have this mind among you which was in Christ Jesus. And right. that's, that's the kind of attitude right. we need. And, and he does the same thing here in verse 5. So in Christ, we need to think this way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Paul is already hinting at an attitude of humility that he has talked about earlier and he will continue to address in other of his letters. Mm -hmm. um, verse 5. 4 and 5 brings us to a metaphor that Paul uses for the church that he loves dearly. It's the metaphor of the body. Yes. He uses it. He's already written to the Corinthians. In, in 1 Corinthians 12, he talks mm -hmm. about the body with its parts. Yeah. Later, he'll write a prison letter to the Ephesians. In Ephesians 4, he talks about the body with the parts there. Yeah. And he talks about this, uh, me he uses this metaphor to make a variety of points. Sometimes he's emphasizing that the body parts need to maintain their connection to the head. Right. That's the only way they stay alive. Yeah. Ephesians, Otherwise, yeah. they're just amputated body parts. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes he emphasizes that each body part must be connected to the body as a whole, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we need to respect one another. The different functions. Yes, and, yeah. and we get that here. Mm -hmm. uh, some folks may remember in 1 Corinthians 12 that you referred to, uh, the eye can't say to the ear, I don't need you, or right. to the foot, or to whatever. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we all need each other. Mm -hmm. So he uses this in a variety of ways, and he, uh, he'll continue using it. Um, Ephesians, it, it shows mm -hmm. up again, doesn't it? Yes. Which yeah. is a letter lit, written maybe five years, six years later. Mm -hmm. Well, wh what is it that he's emphasizing here uh, using this metaphor? First of all, in verse 4, he says, Just as each of us has one body with many members, these members do not all have the same function. That, that appears to be his first mm -hmm. emphasis, doesn't it? Yeah. The diversity of function. So in Christ... We, though many, are, we form one body. Each member belongs to all the others. Yeah. So there, there are two more. So diverse functions in the church. Second, we are in Christ. Christ mm -hmm. is the head. Mm -hmm. We are the body connected to Christ. And then the third thing you said was what? At the end of five? Um, oh, each member belongs to belongs to all the to others. To all the others. Yeah. Now, what, what what emphasis is that? Well, there's a there's a connection with one another as well as with Christ, and and we need to to recognize that. Somebody said the the call to walk in Christ is indeed Corpus Christi, which is the Latin the for body, the body of, Christ. of Christ. For the whole of the Christian life is lived in the body of Christ, mm -hmm. as we relate to one another and function together. The rest of the world can see Christ in our relationships mm -hmm. and in who we are. Yeah. And who we are. So that's a lovely emphasis there. Mm -hmm. In verse 6, he comes back to the diversity issue. He mentioned the same, uh, we don't all have the same function in verse 4. And now he uses the word gifts. It's, it's the word grace gifts, mm -hmm. the gifts that come from the grace of God. And they vary. Now he's going to give us a list here. That includes prophecy, service, teaching, encouragement, giving, leadership, and mercy. How do we view such gift lists? There have been this? people who've, who've taken this list and others and tried to kind of cram them together and make one fit with the other. And yet, he's talking about different things in different mm -hmm. places. And it's obvious he does not mean it to be exhaustive or exclusive that there can be other gifts. Mm -hmm. He's just using these as examples. Right. And it's not like God has this limited list mm -hmm. and everybody has to fit into it someplace, mm -hmm. like the iron bedstead, <laughs> that you either stretch out or you're mm -hmm. cut off to fit it. <laughs> and sometimes we take the gift tests and go to gift conferences mm -hmm. and so forth. And we come out with some attitudes and we think, that's not exactly what Paul's trying to say here. Yeah. So um, some, some misimpressions that we don't want to give. Number one, none of the lists of gifts that Paul includes is exhaustive. Right. 
And it's not that everyone needs to check off every one of these gifts. Right. That's another yeah. misimpression. It's as if each of these gift lists begins with E.G. For example, right. here yeah. are some of the gifts. Yeah. And so in, Galat in uh, Corinthians we get one list, here we get a, another list. Mm -hmm. It's also the case, I think, that Paul is not suggesting that we have to figure out which one of these gifts is our gift, right. and then we kind of just forget about all the others. Right. Right? Or that any one person has one gift and nobody else can have that. Ah. You have to let that one person do it. That's <laughs> the only one that can do that. Right. Um, I, one thing I like to say is I've never met a one gifted Christian. Right. Right? Every Christian I know uh, has, has wonderful opportunities to serve in the church in, in a variety of ways. Right. Sometimes uh, one, uh, one gift more than others comes to the fore or, or one period of, of life or ministry allows us to exercise one mm -hmm. gift. I mean, um, when, you, I, when you, I was you, in... You've, you've been through an evolution. Right. When I was in full-time pastoral ministry, uh, there was a time when I was really pulled all different directions in preaching and teaching and counseling and leadership administration. And this passage in Romans 12 helped me to see that prophesying or proclamation, preaching, mm -hmm was at that time my primary responsibility. I needed to be focusing on that. Mm -hmm. Later on, I came to a point of becoming a teacher mm -hmm. in, a, in Christian college, mm -hmm. and teaching became my primary focus, and that was what I needed to mm -hmm. emphasize. But it's not like we can't do the others, and sometimes we may be in situations where we may be doing lots of different things at different times where there's a need, and to say that I won't serve or can't serve because that's not my gift, well, it may not be your primary gift or may, you may not be the best at that, but maybe mm -hmm. you're the best one that can serve at this time. And in that time, at that time and in that place. Yeah. yeah. And this, this goes back to the way our passage started. Present your whole selves as living, holy, pleasing sacrifices to God. Mm -hmm. And so we look for all the ways in which the giftedness that God in his grace mm -hmm. uh, through our faithful response to him has granted us and look for times and opportunities. Yeah, and, and I've seen people that. with particular strengths in particular mm -hmm. areas. I, I knew a, a very successful wealthy farmer who was not impressive appearing and you would never guess, but he was excellent in being able to give considerably sized gifts to particular ministries mm -hmm. without fanfare, mm -hmm. but doing it very strategically. And it's part so, of what Paul's saying here. If it is in giving, then give generously, which means sincerely, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, like that. Well, um, this passage is a wonderful passage. It's called us to a life of sacrifice, a life of sacrifice, not a death of sacrifice, a life of sacrifice in which we open ourselves to the transforming work of God in Christ through his spirit. We approach God with humility, looking for all the ways in which our grace giftedness can be of service to him. And we wish that for you this week. Thanks for joining us, and we'll be back next week, so hope you'll join us then. Have a great week. This has been In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson brought to you as a ministry of First Christian Church in Johnson City, Tennessee. Our thanks to our teachers that led us for this week's lesson. Join us again next week for another lesson from the International Bible School lesson text. This has been a production of First Christian Church.